All right, everyone, we are going to get started um, with today's webinar. We got a pretty good crowd on, so we will get started. Thank you all for being on with us today. We are really ready to take a deep dive into this topic, and we're super excited to be joining forces with Station A. So thank you to the Station A team for being on with us. This webinar is titled SGIP Equity Resiliency Budget, How to Identify and Close Deals. The new SGIP incentives have been a hot topic in the past few months, especially the equity resiliency. I think it's safe to say that this um, incentive has been causing a lot of confusion since the initial proposed decision was released last year. And since we've seen the updated eligibility requirements and everything in between, I do want to give a quick shout out to CALSA. They have been producing some really awesome fact sheets and webinars on the new incentives, and we are eager to add our expertise on top of that. Throughout the next hour, we'll be diving deep into the qualification criteria for equity resiliency incentives, what led up to the SGIP program being modified, and what combination um, of tools you can use to help you identify the people who do qualify and close those deals. So quick housekeeping before we start, as usual, we will be recording this webinar and sending it out to everybody who registered after the webinar ends, whether you attended or not. The slide deck is also going to be included in that email, so be on the lookout for that after we finish. That will have the links that we're going to mention throughout the webinar today. We also do our Q&A at the end, but please chat your questions throughout the webinar into the chat box, and we're going to get to as many as we can after. So again, we are excited to have Station A on this webinar with us. Thank you again. A lot of you might know who they are, but for those of you who don't, they've got an amazing tool that they're gonna show off that provides clean energy recommendations for more than a million buildings across the country. And more specifically, they are able to identify residential and non-residential buildings that fall under these eligibility requirements. So Station A CEO, Kevin Berkemeyer is on with us today. We are also joined by Kevin Mulvey. He is the Manager of Policy and Technology at Energy Toolbase. We also have Vice President of Business Development, Adam Gerza, and myself. I am the Marketing Manager here at ETB. So the ESTRA program, um, as most of you know, has been around for quite some time, since 2001, actually. It is one of the longest um, and most successful incentive programs in the country. It's been a big pillar in the growth of distributed energy technologies across the state and extremely essential in the growth of solar and storage projects. So it was uh, initially designed as a peak load reduction program, but has evolved quite significantly since then. The program's main focus today is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through these technologies after a bill was passed in 2011 to shift that focus. So with the passing of SB 700, the growth is expected to increase dramatically um, with the additional funding. SB 700 was passed in August of 2018, just as the SGIP program was about to come to an end. This bill gave the program a much needed extra $800 million boost in funding for renewable projects, which was a huge win. The CPUC's initial budget allocation plan said that the equity resiliency budget, which is what we're going to be focusing on throughout this webinar, would get $100 million in funding. Um, this was the new program. It followed the destructive and deadly wildfires in California and the public safety power shutoffs that followed. This past January, the final budget allocation was published, which awarded the equity resiliency budget $513 million in funding for residential and non-residential projects. That is more than 60% of the entire budget. So this definitely shocked a lot of people. I mean, it is more than five times what was initially expected. So we are hitting mostly on equity resiliency here, but we did want to take a quick look at the entire SGIP storage incentive budgets. The equity budget, which was established in, for low-income customers in 2016 <clears throat> and carved out 25 of the, of the S, percent of the SGIP funds, received $24 million. This program didn't really have a meaningful uptake in the past four years, which the CPUC did acknowledge in their decision by bringing that incentive level up to $850 a kilowatt hour. Unfortunately, small residential hardly got the assistance it needed with only $57 million allocated. There was only a $3 million uh, carryover as residential money was used up in 
just weeks really after the application window opened and everything else has been waitlisted. According to the updated SCHIP handbook, if um, the small residential budget runs out, program administrators can use funds from the large scale storage category if applicable to fund residential projects as they are submitted. So overall, what we get from this is that not a ton was allocated to the general market budget, which is the large scale, and the small residential outside the equity and the equity resiliency budgets. Okay, so I think the one thing that we've noticed with this equity resiliency budget is that it's going to be quite challenging to, um, or so we've speculated, to find customers who do qualify unless you have the right tools to do so. Many have already been voicing frustrations over this and they are concerned that the number of customers who qualify will be slim due to the extensive um, eligibility requirements. So we did wanna go over those quickly. Um, here is the non-residential eligibility criteria. These buildings, um, they're deemed critical facilities and they need to have power during emergency situations or the public safety power shutoffs, the blackouts. So those who qualify, um, those, the buildings that qualify are either in or serve at least one low income area in a tier two or tier three high fire threat district. They have experienced at least two or more public safety power shutoff events. These buildings include police and fire stations, any emergency first response providers, hospitals, and this is just kind of uh, to name a few of them. Uh, again, like I mentioned, we are going to be sending these slides out after the webinar for you to take a closer look. I know we're going through this stuff kind of quick, but we've got a lot to get to. Um, here are the eligibility requirements for residential projects. The main one being that customers, again, have to be in that tier two or three high fire threat district. Another criteria that's worth noting quickly is that if the customer, again, has been affected by two or more power shutoffs, uh, these uh, events are only going to increase, meaning the demand for backup power is going to grow. Other criteria includes a customer who is a medical baseline customer or has a serious illness that could threaten life if they were to experience a power outage. So it is a ton to wrap your head around, um, even just looking at the eligibility requirements. The SCHIP handbook was just released recently, so we're going to include that in the slide deck. We're also going to be publishing our own definitive guide. Um, to the updated SCHIP program soon. But at the end of the day, all of this isn't totally final. Um, we're still expecting to possibly see some changes to the guidebook and possibly some changes to the stuff we are going over today. But overall, the equity resiliency budget was put into place largely because of the increase in wildfires and these public safety power shutoffs, which will lead to higher demand for home storage. And with that, being said, I'm going to pass things off to Kevin Mulvey from the Energy Tool Base team. Hey, Tracy, can you hear me? Yep, I can. Hey, so thank you for having me and uh, <laughs> I'm happy to be here today. Um, again, Kevin Mulvey, I'm with Energy Toolbase, and I'm uh, glad to be here to share some thoughts, um, which I think will help give some context to what we're talking about here today. Um, but I just want to say quick, please excuse any background noise. Um, I'm calling in from New York. I'm at this uh, GTM Northeast Solar and Storage Forum today. Uh, so bear with me if you hear any kind of background noise. Um, but I just wanted to jump in. I recently published an article on uh, Solar Power World, uh, which Tracy's showing right here, entitled uh, Public Safety Power Shutoffs and Equity Resiliency Incentives, a Perfect Storm for Home Energy Storage Demand. Uh, so I'm going to recap the main points of that article and provide a little bit more context into the history of public safety power shutoffs and how we got to where we are today. Um, just to, to start it off, I kind of wanted to... I, I'm, wanted to provide a definition that I pulled off of the CPUC website of public safety power shutoffs. Um, they refer to it as a, a preventative system that utility companies use when they predict extreme weather conditions that could cause damage to electrical transmission and distribution lines, which can ignite fires. Um, so this uh, public safety power shutoffs uh, are also known as de-energization. Um, uh, we know it today as public safety power shutoffs or the PSPS acronym that's 
practically a household name in California at this point. Uh, and that really came into light following 2019's fire season, uh, where widespread de-energization events, mainly in the PG&E territory, led to over 3 million people in California losing electricity, and many uh, many of those people were out of power for several days. Um, what, what many people don't know is that de-energization, it's been a means of wildfire mitigation uh, for over a decade. In uh, 2007, catastrophic wildfires in <clears throat> uh, SDG&E territories um, led to uh, the development of wildfire mitigation plans that included de-energization as a last resort uh, in preventing fires. Um, and since then, it's been used by SDG&E uh, in more rural territories, um, but not so much as to make any kind of headlines or, or get any media attention. Uh, but over the past five years, Increasing intensity in the wildfires uh, eventually led to what we saw at the end of 2019, both 2017 and 18. So worst on record wildfire seasons in California. And in uh, 2018, there was a report released from the Wall Street Journal that showed investigations had found PG&E infrastructure to be responsible for more than 1,500 uh, fires between 2014 and 17. Um, and as many of you may know, uh, PG&E was actually forced into bankruptcy as a result. Um, so after all that, uh, utilities have made the decision to lean heavily on public safety power shutoffs to mitigate fires and even just to limit their own liability. Uh, and this is what we started to see in 2019. Um, and no one can really say if a shutoff actually prevented a fire or not. Um, what we can say, though, is the overuse of this tool can create its own problems. Um, the energization the energization in itself can be dangerous. Um, you have public safety concerns such as uh, loss of traffic signals, um, power to critical facilities, loss of telecommunications, home medical equipment, uh, just to name a few. But the objective is to allow utilities to de-energize as a last resort and not solely as an effort to reduce their own liability. Um, so in an effort to ensure proper use of de-energization, the CPUC created guidelines and is continuing to improve them to ensure pre-invent communication standards are implemented <clears throat> and that they're only using de-energization as an emergency measure, exhausting all other fire mitigation options first. Um, some of the guidelines uh, include forcing utilities to create education and outreach campaigns, work with first responders, develop notification and communication protocols for alerting customers, um, they're also forced to generate reports following each public safety power shot. Well, it looks like we might have lost Kevin. He's kind of, like he said, he's at the conference um, up in the Northeast. So I think we did lose his audio there, but um, no worries on that. Um, so overall, kind of what Kevin is saying is that with these public safety power shutoffs, that it's just going to really create a perfect storm for home energy storage. The demand is going to increase significantly. People already want people already want backup power. They're already asking for it. Um, so we are expected. Sorry. <laughs> no worries, Kevin. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that, everybody. It's <clears throat> I lost uh, lost touch there. But as I was saying, um, the uh, um, guidelines also force um, the utilities to generate reports, um, which can outline lessons learned and help further refine the process. Um, as you can see on the slide here, I shared a couple images from the PG&E website, breaking down some of their decision-making criteria, uh, as well as some of their notification standards uh, that have been developed. Um, and if you're curious and would like to know more information on what's happening with the energization, the CPUC also has a webpage uh, where they share each post um, event report uh, and track all policy action. Uh, that link will be shared at the end of the presentation uh, with a bunch of other links that Tracy's going to share. Um, so just to note also on, on that, uh, comprehensive wildfire mitigation plans are in development um, that uh, include more than just the energization, but the provo proposed mitigations within these plans can take many years to implement and can be extremely costly. So for now, de-energization is the most readily available tool for the utilities um, 
and that said, at the end of the day, the de-energization events are looming. Um, so it's clear that you need to have some sort of backup power source if you want to ensure consistent electricity for your home or your business. Um, the CPUC, they know that, and they're and that's the driving force behind the changes we've seen in the SGIP program that we're talking about today and the increased budget for equity resiliency. Because um, the CPUC, <coughs> excuse me, the CPUC can't guarantee that the events won't happen, but they can support the mitigation plans with incentive programs um, to help people get battery backup for their home, especially uh, those most in need of the financial support and those most impacted by the outages. Um, in fact, CALSA estimates that there will be approximately 6,500 or so residential systems that will be funded by the program. Um, but the problem we face now is the complexity in determining who qualifies for what. Um, the SGIP handbook was finally released last week, uh, and it's clocking in at 134 pages. Uh, it's complicated, and the whole thing can be very confusing. Um, Tracy is currently working on a long-form a uh, summary for the new SGIP program rules and uh, eligibility requirements. And uh, CALSA has already done a great job um, producing fact sheets, which Tracy had mentioned, uh, which is what we currently rely on. But it's still a bit of a tangled web of muddled information. There's a lot of nuances to navigate, and it just can be very difficult to figure out. Um, so one of the biggest challenges for developers um, is identifying projects that qualify for the lucrative dollar a watt uh, equity re re resiliency budget. Um, so with that, I'm going to pass it over to Kevin Berkmeyer at Station A, who's going to uh, demo how their software tool can help developers do exactly that. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. I appreciate it. Um, always good to share a webinar with another Kevin. Uh, so thanks for going through that. Um, so my name is Kevin Berkmeyer, CEO, co-founder of Station A. Uh, thanks to Energy Toolbase, uh, the Energy Toolbase and the ETB team for inviting us to participate in this webinar. Uh, it's definitely something that, that we're excited to uh, participate in and help you know, all the different stakeholders figure out you know, which SGIP incentive applies to a specific location. Um, so I've just started uh, here, as you can see my screen, by going to stationa.com um, and uh, we'll kind of kick things off from there. But to give you some initial context, Station a is a software company. Uh, that helps our users determine which clean energy option is best for any building. Uh, so today we're going to show you three things primarily. So one is how to leverage our tech to find good SGIP project opportunities. Um, two is to better understand the incentive level for any building to kind of uh, bring some more clarity and transparency to that 134 page SGIP handbook that, that Kevin was just talking about. Um, and then three, uh, kick things over to ETB um, to take that information and further refine your economic analysis. Uh, what's great is everything I'm going to show you right now is or are things that you can do uh, yourself. Um, and so, like I said, start um, by going to station.com um, and click join now here. Uh, if you um, do not have an account, you can create a new account. Um, if you're a current customer or current user, you, you already have an account. Um, I obviously already have an account, so I'll just sign in um, with my account. Um, and then you'll arrive. Um, at uh, this dashboard, so the dashboard to our web app. Um, and what this shows you um, is effectively uh, you know, the, the status of your subscription, uh, updated or information on new releases, as well as tutorials to kind of get you started. Um, now, we want to start by um, you know, finding good SGA product opportunities um, by effectively starting in you know, what we call our explore mode. So click on this, this icon on the left. Um, as you can see, this is the map you know, the United States. And what this enables is doing a bottoms up analysis um, to effectively explore any of those million you know, plus buildings that Tracy has indicated or mentioned um, by map. Um, so let's say that I am a developer. I want to explore Northern California specifically. Um, and I want to zoom in to an area um, that you know, would be close to uh, you know, Paradise, California, for example, um, where I know um, this particular region was affected by uh, multiple PSPS events. So as I dive further in, um, you start to see additional layers of data that we've indexed. So these yellow dots represent substations. Uh, the interconnecting yellow lines represent transmission lines. Um, these purple kind of outlined areas, localities. Um, and then in some cases, we have circuit data as well. But as you zoom in, you start to see more and more information. Um, so building footprints start to show up. Parcels start to show up. Um, we've also indexed about 140 million 
uh, land parcels from across the United States. Um, so I just you know, picked Oroville, uh, California. Um, and let's just click on the specific location here. Um, now, what you immediately see is a satellite image of that location. Um, some just brief questions here about that location. What these questions help us do is annotate our data um, to improve our machine learning algorithms and our estimates um, for our users. Um, so is this overshadowed? I'm just going to click no here. Um, you get a quick snapshot into uh, the savings potential of solar, solar plus battery, or standalone battery for that you know, given location um, on this initial uh, place card page. Uh, we can dive into detail um, uh, and really start to understand all the relevant information about a location to inform whether or not they would be a good candidate for a specific solution. Uh, so in this case, the solar system size that we're modeling, the battery system size that we're modeling, um, as well as the standalone battery system size that we model, um, and the associated savings you know, with that specific uh, solution. Uh, locational information, such as your roof area, floor area, number of stories, parcel number, uh, the owner of that, so Oracle Hospital, so in this case, a hospital, other geographic information associated with that specific location, uh, energy predictions for that location. So this is without any kind of upfront uh, load information from that location. Um, but energy predictions disaggregated by cooling, heating, lighting, and equipment on an annual basis. Um, and then also just showing a monthly view, again, disaggregated by cooling, heating, lighting, and equipment. Um, and then lastly, uh, grid information. Uh, so estimated cost of electricity, uh, so about 13 and a half cents, broken down by demand, energy, and fixed costs, um, and the underlying tariff that that's associated with or based on. Um, and so in this case, E19, TOU tariff, PG&E, a link to that specific tariff. Um, also just a view into all the other tariffs that you've assessed for that specific location. Um, now, down to you know, the, the kind of area that's more relevant to you know, this specific webinar, but the available programs. So we um, have modeled um, and identified specific incentive programs that are available to you know, many of the million buildings that we have um, indexed. Um, in California, we've identified you know, this specific location um, or many locations as being uh, within the 80-1550 low-income community um, territory or area, as well as you know, within the high fire threat districts uh, as designated by CPUC. Um, also identified nearby substation, utility ISO. Um, so all of this information um, uh, is available for those million buildings that I noted before. Um, now, another way to kind of explore this data um, from a, a bottoms-up perspective is um, if you already have an address or, say, an entity name, I can simply do a keyword search. So let's you know, fly down to uh, Southern California and go to Hart High School in Santa Clarita. Um, now, we fly down to the specific area. Um, now, what's interesting about uh, Southern California is we've also integrated circuit data. So these kind of red lines are also circuits. Um, and um, in this case, uh, you can see Hart High School. We can also just apply different you know, visual modes. Uh, so we can change the base layer to be a satellite image. So you can look at, let's say, for example, whether or not you know, this, this specific area or location um, mm -hmm. will be a good candidate for a carport, or if there already is you know, carport solar installed. Um, we can also you know, go back to that vector base layer, but color code you know, locations by their solar potential, battery potential, or annual peak. Um, to get a more visual sense for a representation for you know, the relative um, compatibility that a specific location has with solar storage um, or different solutions that you might be trying to sell them. Um, again, you click on that location, you get a similar view into um, that specific building. In this case, this is just one of the buildings that are within the Hart High School campus. Um, are there loading docks? No. Um, but again, showing you know, that quick quote, additional detail around that quote, uh, the locational data, in this case, you know, William S. You know, Hart Union High School, um, energy information, a 708 kilowatt peak, uh, grid information, so about 15 and a half cent um, per kilowatt hour uh, cost of electricity based on uh, this SC tariff, TOU 8D, um, and then again, those programs. So this is also in an AB 1550 low-income community and then a high fire threat, excuse me, high fire threat district. Um, as designated by CPUC. Now, um, I've shown you kind of the, the bottoms up way of, of exploring this information. 
Uh, the other way is to take a more top-down perspective, um, use uh, what we call our analyze mode. Um, and this is what enables you to create a list of locations that um, fulfill a certain criteria. I'm not gonna go through the process of creating a list. Um, I'm just gonna click on um, this specific list here, um, the SGIP priority population. So we pre-built this list. Um, uh, and this is a list of locations that are in both a high fire threat district and a low income community. Um, as I've shown you previously, just aggregated. Um, and let me click on to that quickly um, here. And so we offer you know, this pre-built list to our subscribers. Um, and this gives you more of a matrix view of the different locations. Um, what I've already kind of gone ahead and done is you know, adjust some of the columns here. Um, what I wanna start by showing is just the aggregate potential. Um, so here are these top uh, tabs here, you can see aggregate, so average 200 kilo kilowatt system, but um, you know, some of around 950 megawatts of, of total peak, um, about 952 megawatts of solar potential or 200 kW average system size. And then battery system size, your know, total uh, technical potential of 425 uh, megawatts there. Um, like I mentioned before, you can edit these columns. So, you know, I turned off the default columns and I just applied what I you know, think would be relevant in this case. So annual peak, solar potential, you know, you can turn that on and off, battery potential, who owns that specific location, the programs um, associated uh, with that location are available to that location, like the CPUC high fire threat districts, uh, low income communities, disadvantaged communities, and then the cost of electricity. Click done. Um, and then as you can see, you can start to explore these locations. Um, and, you know, we've indexed over 4,700 locations that would apply to that specific, you know, criteria. Uh, and as I just start combing through these, you know, I can do a number of different things. I've sorted these by solar potential. So you can kind of start to narrow or whittle down that list you know, based on kind of what you're looking for. Um, but let's say, you know, I can just continue to uh, scroll through these and I want to find, you know, a, a school, for example. Um, and yeah, bam, right there, Palmdale School District. Um, what's interesting is, um, does this have industrial equipment? I'd say no. Uh, again, you see that quote, this looks like there is actually, you know, carport installation here. Um, and so in this case, you know, it could be a good candidate to you know, add an additional uh, or add additional storage capacity. Um, and again, you know, going down to grid available programs, you know, hitting the, the programs that we're effectively looking to target. Um, let's see if we can just quickly find that horrible hospital. Uh, and there it is. Um, so again, uh, that specific building that we saw within the map um, from that more kind of bottoms up uh, approach. And so this representing that more top down approach. Uh, now, while I'd say this web app provides a solution, a very you know, kind of clear solution to figure out who could potentially qualify for the higher SG um, incentive levels. You realize it's also very difficult, as Kevin highlighted, you know, to figure out which incentive level applies to a given building. And you know, this is especially compounded by you know, the, the thrilling read that is the 100-page SG handbook. Um, uh, so it's even harder for a homeowner or a commercial building owner to figure this out as well. And so we're excited to announce uh, and release a new app today that really uh, helps anyone determine the SGIP incentive level for any building for free. Um, so including large scale and residential applications of storage, solar plus storage. Um, and we've built this primarily to bring transparency to a very complex program, essentially convert that 134 page PDF doc into effectively 100 lines of code. Um, and as I mentioned before, we're offering this for free and plan to embed it in uh, many different websites, utilities, CCA websites, others, CALSA, if they're interested, frankly, anybody who's interested will embed it in their website for free um, with, the in with the intent and idea to bring this information to any stakeholder to help them understand the options for any given building more efficiently, bring transparency to this program, enable scale um, at the end of the day. Um, so this new application uh, can be accessed by going to um, sta.link slash SGIP, as I just entered there. So I encourage anyone to just do this in real time if you'd like. Um, and uh, when I click on that, um, what you get is a view into, uh, you know, an overview or a view into all, I'd say all the relevant information associated with the SGIP program um, that would help, uh, you know, help you kind of understand this, this offering or, or incentive level on program. Um, so the overview includes just high level overview, funds available, program start, uh, program end, 
Um, eligibility, we'll kind of come back to this, but effectively uh, this eligibility or ESTIC calculator as, as we've been calling it. Um, events, so relevant uh, events that have occurred over the, over the pre previous um, you know, days and months. Um, and then related information, so uh, you know, links to the relevant sites as well as to the handbook as we talked about before. Now, if we go back to eligibility, uh, what we want to show you is um, you know, how to determine you know, the incentive level for any building. Um, and so what you effectively start by doing is entering an address and then or a, um, a specific location um, and then answering a simple logical flow of questions. So let's just go back to that, you know, Oroville Hospital example uh, uh, yeah, that we uh, located previously. Um, what type of location is it? You know, we know it's a healthcare facility. Um, have you experienced two or more PSPS, PSPSs in the last year? Uh, we know that, you know, we have um, good news, you know, we qualify for the S-chip equity, you know, resilience incentive, so that $1,000 a kilowatt hour incentive. Um, and then also just give an indication for how much of the typical battery or islandable battery system costs that that incentive would cover. Um, these costs are just based on uh, market feedback, you know, from all the different uh, you know, sellers who, who uh, you know, are members of the Station A network and use our platform. Um, and we'll start to, we'll continue to adjust those, you know, as we, um, uh, you know, as that information, you know, is, is further updated. Um, now we can also just input, you know, other addresses. Let's look up that, you know, high school that we, we talked about, um, Hart High School on New Hill Ave. Uh, we know that this is a, um, you know, an educational institution. Uh, so subject to $850 kilowatt hour incentive. Now, let's say that we also know that because in many cases, schools can be shelters. We also know that it's a shelter. Um, we do think that it is in a high fire threat district. We just wanna confirm that that's correct. Um, as we continue to get more information on where these specific locations or where these tier three, tier two districts are located, um, we'll continue to improve you know, this to make this more definitive. But let's say yes, and you know, there you see, subject to that you know, $1,000 kilowatt hour incentive. Um, you can also step back uh, and let's say we want to look at uh, a, a home, you know, residential address. So let's just pick a home, uh, a home address that's, uh, you know, right across the street from Hart High School, just for the sake of simplicity, um, in Santa Clarita. Uh, we know that this is a single family home. Uh, we also, maybe we know that it's a low income home um, and it's subject to that S-chip equity incentive uh, of 850 kilowatt hours. Uh, now, $850 a kilowatt. Now let's say it's not, you know, low-income low income home. You can see that adjustment. You can see that this is now subject to that step seven um, incentive level uh, specifically. Um, so encourage you all to you know, go to the sta.link slash SGIP um, to explore, play around um, with this eligibility calculator. Anybody who's interested in embedding this in a website, happy to do that. Share with your customers too, to the extent that that's helpful. Um, or valuable, um, and then feel free to reach out, you know, with feedback to email us at support at station a.com if you have any issues. Um, so now once you've qualified a location as a good SGIP project, you know that incentive level, um, you can now easily transition your workflow to energy tool base to refine the economic value analysis. Energy tool base has always been kind of a, a great partner of ours. A lot of our users also use energy tool base. And so Adam will you know, walk through how they're incorporating the latest S-chip incentives into their models. I just would add one, you know, last thing. Just don't forget to follow uh, Station A on LinkedIn and Twitter. That's where we share all of our latest product updates, data enhancements, new features on a weekly basis. Uh, we also tweet a lot of the presidential candidates to call them out on how they can achieve their renewable energy targets in more effective ways. Uh, so feel free to follow us. And thanks for the time. Feel free to reach out with any questions. All right, I'm going to take the ball. Thank you, Kevin. Hey, everyone, this is Adam with Energy Toolbase. Let me confirm I'm showing the right screen here. Tracy, maybe you can give me a... I can see a bunch of different screens open. I can see a script and... Yeah, there we go. Awesome. See. All right, all set. Um, well, yeah, Kevin, that's actually the first time I think I've seen you do a full run-through of your demo uh, for myself. Uh, very impressive what you guys are doing over there. Um, I thought really especially cool to see 
um, how you're doing both that top down, um, you know, kind of prospecting um, kind of workflow and then separately just the bottoms up where a developer can come in, enter an address and, you know, hopefully look up the eligibility of that specific site and customer. Um, you know, uh, uh, Kevin Mulvey said it, Tracy said it, um, now that the program is launching, uh, a lot of folks we're talking to, uh, the challenge now will be uh, identifying eligible projects in the program. And again, we think Station A is very complementary with Energy Tool Base to do that function. And then of course, what we're really good at is running that full financial model, um, quantifying what sort of utility bill savings are achievable, incorporating the incentives like we're talking about here, uh, and building up that full customer facing proposal. So that's what I'm going to be covering during my section here. Uh, and then, yeah, just my one other like preview thought before I jump in, it, it's already been said, but uh, it's worth saying again, uh, the equity resiliency program is, it's historic by, by all measures. Uh, Tracy had that slide earlier, $613 million, $613 million uh, dollars total budget carve out is just incredible much much bigger than i think a lot of the policy folks uh, were expecting who have been following this um, over the last year or two and then of course the thousand dollar a kilowatt hour incentive level is is very very lucrative um, likely paying for the full or near full cost of the installed energy storage system uh, especially considering when you're when you're pairing this with a uh, an investment tax credit so the, uh, the table is set. The, uh, the program is on the brink of opening for business. And um, we're, I think, like a lot of folks, going to be very interested to watch reservation activity over the first few months. OK, without further ado, let me jump into my section. And I also have a really exciting announcement on the energy tool base side. If you're seeing my screen, uh, just this morning, we went live. We, uh, we globalized two new incentives in our incentive database and that is the equity budget incentive and the equity resiliency budget incentive, uh, which means these are now available for all users to access uh, and run projects on. And I'm gonna talk about the logic uh, we, we built behind the scenes. Um, we're very confident these are um, very, very accurate for all scenarios. Um, so actually maybe just showing that screen real quick. Um, Tracy, give me a confirm, you can see this screen as well. Yep, I can see it. Perfect. So yeah, those are right there at the top now. Um, just a couple things to mention. Uh, for those of you that we custom dropped in that quote unquote proposed incentive, uh, if you wouldn't mind, please go in and archive those. Um, we're going to encourage you not to use any those anymore and really rely uh, and use the global incentives, which have all of the dynamic logic, which I'm about to dive into. Um, maybe one other quick comment here. Um, the general market SGIP incentives are going to be going live on our platform very soon. Um, let's say probably within the next week or so. Um, we've done all the hard work with kind of configuring the rules and the logic, and now we're just going to be creating the various different steps. Uh, and then we'll be archiving all of the, uh, the current ones or the legacy ones, and we'll do that prior to uh, April 1 when the program relaunches. Okay, so let's talk about the logic behind the scenes. Um, you know, during Tracy's section uh, at the top, she was really talking about eligibility criteria. Uh, and that's obviously what uh, the Station A folks are uh, kind of productizing, um, really, you know, making a really good user experience to enter an address and understand um, which SGIP bucket they would fall into. Okay, once you've, let's say, identified an equity resiliency bucket project or an equity budget project, um, the incentive logic is quite complex. Uh, and this is what we've been working on, um, I will say, kind of, uh, kind of around the clock over the last week to have these really precisely calculate um, based on all different types of scenarios. Uh, and mind you, uh, again, the, the guidebook just dropped a week ago officially. Um, so we've been kind of scrambling to get ready on our end. Uh, and I actually want to give a really quick shout out to uh, Robert Bates over in our uh, South Carolina office, who did a lot of the legwork with building these incentives and also uh, a lot of testing against different scenarios, which we're about to talk about. Okay, so effectively, here's a really high level rundown on the rules. Uh, the small category is under 10 kW. 
anything over puts you into the large category or the CNI bucket. Uh, they did change the rule now where all CNI projects or all uh, SGIP projects over 10 kW will now get half of their incentive um, via the performance-based incentive uh, mechanism. That changed. It used to be uh, 30 kW as the threshold. Um, they also changed the cycling requirement. Um, we're now at 104 uh, cycles a year as the floor. Uh, and if you're not cycling at least that much, you're going to get a linear degradation on your PBI, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, uh, and of course, the, both the capacity decline degradation, uh, systems over two megawatt hours in capacity um, start to get a haircut on the incentive amount. Uh, and the same goes um, for the equity resiliency budget projects. It's actually over four hour duration. Um, so I'm going to actually show you an example of that in just a minute here. So why don't we pivot back over to the app and just kind of look at a couple of different runs um, where we're going to show off how we dynamically calculate these. Uh, and these uh, are both um, the small and the under 10 kW residential and the over 10 kW commercial. So these wor will work for both. Um, this particular project here is a very simple residential run. Um, we use the, uh, the Solar Edge LG integration for this one. It's a 5 kW, 10 kWh. Um, and I have both the equity resiliency budget and a tax credit selected in step three. Let's jump right over to see how this renders inside of a proposal. Uh, and you can see where that calc is landing at uh, and also kind of where that uh, value exactly happens in a cash flow. Um, again, the under 10 kW projects are all paid up front. Um, so there is no performance-based component to this one. Okay, so this is a really simple one. Let's kind of jump into some um, more complex ones. And one thing, actually maybe toggling back to the PowerPoint really quick that you really need to be mindful of with the equity resiliency budget program is the cost cap. Um, we think this will come into play a lot. Uh, there is very explicit language in the guidebook that says the sum of your incentives for the project, which effectively is going to be your, your SGIP incentive and the tax credit, cannot exceed uh, the total installed energy storage project cost. Um, so we do have cost cap logic built in. Uh, here's an example of a commercial run. Just to give context, this is a 30 kW, 60 kWh. Um, looks like we're pricing this one, I guess, pretty close to $1,000 a kilowatt hour installed. Let's jump into a proposal and see how this renders. Um, and you'll notice uh, effectively the way it works is you're going to get your full tax credit. In this case, the 16380 is 26% of the total installed energy storage system cost. Uh, and the SGIP will, can only fill in the rest up to zero. Um, so uh, this one here happened to be paid out uh, performance based, uh, a portion up front, a portion over five years. Um, and we've done very, very extensive testing on our project cost logic because uh, there's lots of different cases and scenarios you can see. Uh, and I'm uh, very confident in saying that um, we've got all of them. Um, so um, the project cost cap, just something to be aware of, especially for the equity resiliency budget projects, because the, uh, you know, obviously the $1,000 a kilowatt hour um, is oftentimes probably going to put you over. Um, let's look at a, another option, cycles. Um, so here's a run where um, the, storage simulation cycled less than 104 times annually. Uh, this particular run cycled 74 times annually. Uh, again, that, the floor moved. It used to be 130. Uh, it is now 104. Um, so we absolutely are also uh, including um, cycle logic into our calculation. So in, a, in an example like this, um, you actually would not get the full SGIP incentive owed to you, uh, right? There was 30,000 up front. The total here should have been 60,000, um, but we're getting haircutted uh, over the PBI five years as a result of the fact that we simply didn't cycle enough. Uh, and that is applied linearly, right? So if you cycled 50% of 104 cycles, you would get 50% of your owed PBI portion. That's actually how we used to do it previously on the legacy incentives. So that didn't change. 
Uh, the only thing that changed is the, uh, the floor, the 104. One more example uh, before I jump back into the deck. Um, this is the five hour duration one, right? So um, now for the equity budget and the equity resiliency budget, um, they're actually uh, drawing the floor at four hour duration. Um, the general market program is still doing it at a two hour duration. Um, and I kind of don't want to get really deep in the weeds here, but effectively what that means is for a longer duration storage project like this one here, a 20 kW, 100 kWh, which we'd refer to as a five hour duration project, the first four hours would get the full incentive, a dollar uh, or a thousand dollars per kilowatt hour. The next marginal, um, in this case, 20 kW of, uh, of capacity would be uh, at 50% of that, at 50 cents. Uh, again, you don't need to like um, really, um, I almost just want to say like trust us in that we've really extensively QA'd uh, these incentives uh, to account for all of these different scenarios where you could get degraded. Um, and ultimately, we want you to get to a place where you're really confident that when you simply choose that incentive, in energy tool base, we're going to get that calculation uh, very precise to how the actual the S chip program and the S chip calculator would uh, calculate that incentive. Uh, that is the goal, and that is what we think we achieved in launching these two incentives. Uh, and again, uh, quick recap: we're going to be archiving all the 2017s uh, in a couple of weeks and launching all of the other general market um, incentives steps, uh, both residential and commercial basically projects that don't qualify for equity resiliency budget or equity budget um, projects, which um, still is uh, the, the vast majority of the state, of course. Okay, I have a couple other things to hit on back in my slide deck. Um, I do want to acknowledge this one, okay? And we really explicitly stated in our incentive, in fact, let me show it to you. It was the, can I get that to serve? It doesn't display as quickly here, but uh, the disclaimer on greenhouse gas reduction requirement. So this calculation here and the incentives that we just launched today assumes the storage system reduces at least five k kilograms of per kilowatt hour uh, storage capacity. And effectively, there is no corresponding um, reduction to PBI. So basically what we're saying is in this in these current version of these two global incentives, we're effectively assuming uh, that we are meeting the GHG reduction requirement. Um, we are absolutely working right now on incorporating this in into an upcoming release where we are dynamically calculating and checking against that GHG reduction requirement. Uh, and I did have an additional slide here because this is uh, something that we've spent a lot of thought on. Um, you know, this, this whole GHG uh, reduction requirement issue, uh, which is obviously this is effective for all SGIP incentives starting April 1 onwards. Um, and I want to bring up this chart. Um, this is a CALSA chart, so I want to make sure I reference them. Uh, and also some of you may be familiar with uh, Watt Time. Uh, Watt Time is a, is a company that is basically the provider uh, of the API uh, that software tools like Energy Toolbase and others will be talking to to get a real-time uh, lookup of what the GHG intensity of the grid is. Um, this table here summarizes what a year looks like. And what I want to highlight for you is this. Um, and I've kind of got the box drawn around the four to nine period. Okay, so what's important to mention here is that almost, actually not almost, for the entire year, if you just kind of do a high level scan, the high intensity GHG period corresponds, it falls directly into that four to nine on peak period. So this means it perfectly lines up with um, the price signal, as I like to say, with the rate schedule, because both residential and commercial across all three IOUs now, um, the on peak period is defined from 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. So whether you're doing time of use arbitrage um, and or um, demand reduction, because oftentimes on the demand reduction um, control strategies, you're, you're really optimizing to reduce on-peak demand. Um, what I'm trying to say here, I'm not being really eloquent about this, but we've done a lot of um, thinking and even um, um, analysis on 
dispatches that we're performing inside Energy Toolbase, and we think uh, for the vast majority of scenarios, the GHG reduction requirement will be a non-issue. Uh, and again, the reason is, is because the high intensity period lines up very, very closely um, with how the rate schedule is defined. Uh, and this holds true for both residential and commercial runs. Um, we actually have a way as kind of a bridge solution to manually confirm this for now, or we can even teach you how to do that. Effectively, all that would entail is downloading out your energy storage dispatch data and overlaying it against a, a chart like this um, in Excel. And um, again, in a lot of the test runs we've done, even net of round trip efficiency loss, um, we're, we're um, pretty confident in saying that we don't think the GHG reduction requirement will be a, will be an issue. Um, that said, we are absolutely still working to incorporate that logic into an upcoming release. Okay, I think I have one last slide, and then I'll pass it over to q and I know we're kind of already coming up on the hour. Um, okay, so this kind of goes back to both Tracy's um, stuff at the top and also my um, uh, summary of a lot of the logic. There's a lot to wrap your head around here. Uh, on the methodology for how these are calculated. Um, there are some things, and I want to kind of use this slide as a disclaimer um, for our users uh, and developers in general um, that you need to be responsible for um, when you're, you know, going after these equity resiliency budget projects and, you know, ultimately showing uh, the economics of what that looks like in a customer facing proposal to, uh, to an end customer that's eligible. You really need to confirm your eligibility um, we, we consider Station A a great tool for um, kind of like scouting and high in the funnel. Um, but if it's if it's us, I think you really want to do your homework and make sure that um, they've checked all the boxes to be eligible for. And that is something you're responsible to do. One thing I didn't talk about, uh, residential has introduced a cycling requirement, um, 52 minimum cycles per year. But what's interesting is the language in the guidebook does not say if you if you don't cycle that much, it's not like they linearly degrade your incentive. Like on the commercial program, what the language says is they'll suspend you from the program in general. Um, and be mindful of the fact also on the residential side, GHG reporting is done on a fleet level. Okay, so say you've installed a hundred energy storage projects residentially. Well, you're doing GHG reporting across all hundred. Uh, and again, um, you need to make sure you're hitting those cycle requirements, or again, you may not be able to go out and get S-chip incentives. Uh, another one, this is kind of deep in the weeds, the 1.69 to one peak ratio. There's lots of stuff in the weeds. Um, I don't think you need to worry about this much, but there is a, um, a requirement that you move your customer to a time of use rate that at least has that um, differential peak to off peak. And um, we've done lots of webinars, you know, the SCE TOUD prime checks that box and the pg and &E EV2 checks that box. All of the utilities have rates that are eligible. You just need to make sure your customer is on one of those. And then lastly, I wanted to end with this one. Uh, this, is a, this is an important one. I think I'm, you know, maybe doing a public service announcement on behalf of the PUC on this one, but I would, I would exercise caution on this last one. Um, there is very explicit language in the guidebook that says um, developers shall not sell uh, a storage system um, for a price that is greater than the price they'd sell the system if they didn't re receive the incentives. You know, again, $1,000 a kilowatt hour for these equity resiliency budget projects is very rich. Adding on top of that, the 30% uh, the investment tax credit um, I would be careful to make sure, and I'm not exactly sure how they'll enforce this, but um, you know that you're not basically um, marking up your storage systems um, because you have so much incentive to draw from. Uh, and again, this whole slide is uh, things that uh, we encourage you, uh, you need to be responsible for. Okay, Tracy, I am way over time. Um, please take it back for Q&A. Alrighty, sounds good. Thank you, Adam. And again, thank you to Kevin and Kevin. We do have a lot of questions coming in. Um, for those of you, again, who asked specific questions either about ETV or Station A, the teams, um, respective teams, are going to reach out to you after the webinar within the next couple of days to get those questions answered. Um, one of the questions um, that I want to address first is how much do we expect this handbook is going to change and the requirements are going to change before that the application windows do open, which is 
coming up. Um, so again, there still is a possibility that some of what's in the handbook right now might change. Um, we did hear that Kelsa filed a protest, so we wouldn't be surprised to see if there was some, there were some slight changes. Um, you know, we don't expect an entire overhaul on the main points that we covered today, but there is a possibility of some changes. Um, another one we had uh, for the S chip folk or for the Station A folks, it was. Um, who are you expecting to use the SGIP calculator? Are you expecting to get customers or building owners to input their addresses to look up their potential incentive level? So Kevin B, I will give that one to you. Yeah, thanks, Tracy. Um, good question. Uh, I mean, expecting anyone to use it, um, I, you know, within our own network of subscribers <clears throat> and members of Station A, you know, we serve sellers, channels, and buyers, so a lot of customers too. Uh, and we consistently found that all three of those segments were asking questions around which incentive level would apply to specific buildings. Uh, you know, so we built this to uh, you know, bring transparency in, in, to that question, um, but at scale, so for any building. I think we probably expect more um, you know, building owners uh, or, or buyers, as, as we call them, um, to leverage it to kind of understand which incentive level applies for a specific building, um, but it's really intended for you know any audience. All right, um, we did have one about um, eligibility requirements. Um, that do they need to be all all of uh, you know under a residential system? Do they need to be in a tier two, three medical baseline and on a well? They have to qualify for at least one of the requirements that are in there. Not all of them. You don't have to meet each requirement. Um, just one of the ones that we mentioned. And again, we're going to send all that out so you can kind of take a look at that. Um, let's see. Uh, Kevin B. We'll, we have a lot on the um, Station A side. So will you update the incentives to show the current step? Um, Kevin B. Uh Yes, definitely. Um, our plan is to uh, maintain this as like a highly up-to-date um, resource for you know, anybody um, to effectively understand you know, the most current incentive level available for any, any building. Okay, I'll give this one to you again, um, Kevin. So how do you compute indicated savings? Um, what's the build cost that you assume? Uh, so we compute indicated savings in the app um, based on the uh, load prediction that we do for that specific building, given what we know about that building, um, based on the estimated cost of electricity. Um, we then size the system based on both load and uh, available space, obstruction, you know, accounting for setbacks for, for solar, accounting for parcel area available for storage, um, and then we run our own financial model. Uh, to determine what that savings is now, that savings is to be um, uh, like looked at as indicative. Um, you know that is you know, based on you know, our estimates. Um, you know we we fully expect you know somebody to once they have actuals um, to start to use something like Energy Toolbase um, to further refine those analyses and, and kind of get to that uh, you know more contracted value. Alrighty, um, Adam, I'll send this one to you. Um, what are the incentive? What will the incentive build out look like in Energy Toolbase once they're all updated into the platform? Yeah, again, I'm uh, actually optimistic. Maybe even by end of week, we'll have all of the general market incentives in there. Um, it's going to be a little tricky because um, we're going to have to have steps two through seven, right? Because the PG&E commercial, as of today, is still in step two. Um, and then the new residential general market program is going to open with a step six and a step seven. And I think the expectation there is there's going to be a there. We already know there's a ton of um, backlog on a wait list for those projects. Uh, and the budget was pretty skinny uh, for the general market residential program. So that money will likely go quickly. So we're going to have steps two through seven. And we're also going to have. Um, uh, another thing just to put on your radar, if it's not already, general market, commercial, there will be a 15 cent resiliency adder. Uh, so if your system can demonstrate that it can, um, you know, operate uh, in an off-grid um, event, 
um, there's a 15 cent, I'm sorry, $15 or 15 cent a watt um, adder. So we're actually going to have steps two through seven, and then we're going to have two variations of it. We're going to have the general, and then we're going to have the, uh, the one with the adder. All right, cool. Um, out of respect for everyone's time, um, we know there were a lot of questions um, pertaining to things that we saw, very specific um, questions. So we're going to, again, reach out to you guys after this webinar via email. So please just give us a minute for those. Um, again, thank you to the Station A team for being on with us today. We're going to send out their info um, in an email after the webinar um, that will also have links to Energy Tool Base free trial. We offer two weeks free um, along with the Station A folks. Um, and that S-chip calculator link. A lot of you were asking about it, so that will definitely be in there as well. So if you do have any other questions, um, our contact info is going to be available, so please reach out. All right, have a good one.